There it is. Um, so welcome. And, and again, thank you, Barbara, for that introduction. Um, I'm also letting people in from the waiting room. So if I feel I seem a little distracted, <laughs> I'm, I'm, vision, I'm, I'm looking at a couple different screens at once. But I'm really excited to be sharing tonight one of my one of my passions, um, which is is working with landowners. This one is really specifically targeted at landowners and looking at maps using the Agency of Natural Resources um, Atlas. Now, before I go to the Atlas, and most of this will really be on the Atlas itself, um, can I ask you all, um, there aren't that many people here, if you could either show me your hand by waving at me or, um, or raise your hand in the reactions, how many of you are familiar with the Agency of Natural Resources Atlas? How many have used it before? Yeah, thumbs up or a wave or a hand or something like that. All right, so a few people have used it, at least a little bit. It looks like many of you have not, um, and, and it's okay no matter where you are on that spectrum. Uh, for tonight's workshop, I'm going to, to start with a really basic introduction to the Atlas, um, the agency that, that the Vermont Agency of Natural Resources have, has put together. Um, so if you haven't seen it before, um, we'll get started with that. And then by the end of the hour, um, then I, I will also leave a little bit of time for those of you who may want to dig a little bit deeper into the Atlas uh, and see what it can do and get into some of those more advanced tools. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, here we go, just one second here. I think I'm going to share my screen. <laughs> um, here we go. And um, and I will I will say Barbara gave me uh, gave a little bit of an introduction to my background. Um, as you can hear, I'm I tend to get myself involved in a lot of things. <laughs> maybe maybe you could say some would say too many things. Um, but my introduction to the atlas was from working with um, with fish and wildlife, Vermont Fish and Wildlife, um, and I was in a role of. Uh, the community wildlife program, which you might be familiar with, um, which really works all over the state with conservation commissions and planning commissions um, and other community groups to help incorporate a lot of the state resources and wildlife um, information into town plans or conservation work um, and that type of thing. And so I, um, I was both involved in putting together some of the, the resources, um, something that we'll, we'll introduce later called BioFinder. Um, but also I was involved in teaching the public and kind of figuring out how these resources could be used. Um, in my current work with Cold Hollow to Canada, which is a little nonprofit that works up in Franklin County, um, looking at wildlife habitat and forest integrity, um, I work with landowners. Um, and so I, I've been really enjoying recently making the mapping resources that are available at the state level um, available and accessible to landowners. So, um, I'll start by introducing, I'm just going to share a link uh, to the site in the chat. Uh, let me find the chat here. Oops, that's not what I meant to do. <laughs> um, actually, it's hard to do while I'm sharing my screen, I'm realizing, Barbara, I don't know if it would be easy yeah. for you to just kind of yep, copy down um, the website. It might be a few minutes. Um, now, I, I know that when you're on the screen and on a computer, it's it's not easy to both follow a webinar and follow along on your own mapping screen, um, but you can choose which one to do if you want to kind of uh, use the Atlas while we're going through this um, and try it out on your own, or if you just want to watch as a demonstration, either one is fine. Um, but I'll start by just saying the Natural Resources Atlas is, I think, a really, really special tool. Um, we live in a state in Vermont where our agency of natural resources has prioritized um, putting all of the mapping resources that they have together in one space and making that available for the public. Um, in talking with colleagues in neighboring states um, and across the country, this is not a resource that's available in every state. So I wanted to start by saying it's, it's really unfortunate that we have this here. Um, but from there, I'll say, um, there are various levels of how you can use this resource. For those who have never seen this before, I'm going to go through some of the very simple controls um, and some of the things that you can do that do not take a lot of effort. And yet, as a landowner, they can really tell you a lot. 
Um, and the first thing I'm going to show is just how to get from this state level map um, into a, a, a space that you can work with. Um, if you go up to quick tools, the very top quick tool is zoom to a town. And I find this one very helpful. You can zoom to a town and um, you might be in various places in Addison County or the rest of the state, but I'm, I live in Middlebury. So I'm just gonna start typing Middlebury. It'll drop down, I'll, I'll click there. And even if I, I didn't quite know how to find Middlebury before, then it'll zoom you right to Middlebury and I can start looking around from there. Um, now, if you're used to any mapping program, even something like Google Maps or something, some of the controls are the same. So you can zoom in using the plus and minus. Um, or if you have a mouse, then you can use the scroll button, which is what I'm doing here, to zoom in and out um, and just kind of get a, get a sense of, of where you are. Now, I didn't actually mean to do it, but um, another thing that you will see very quickly in the, in the Natural Resources Atlas is that you, if you click on something, um, anything that is, is a layer in a map layer in the Atlas that's turned on, it will pop up with a little information box and tell you, um, oh, that, that that road that I actually accidentally um, tapped on is Quarry Road. So anytime you see a feature in the Atlas, you can kind of click on it and it'll pop up with more information. I could do the same with a stream. The streams are sometimes hard to get right on it, but um, oh, I, I clicked on a parcel. Sometimes it comes up with a few different things and you can scroll through them using these arrow keys. So here's a stream or river. In this case, it's not named. Sometimes it'll tell you the name, but that one's just a little one that it doesn't have a name for. Um, and so you can, you can get more information that way. Now, if you zoom in enough, what you'll see is that um, one of these most important, these helpful things for landowners is that it, it actually has the parcel maps already preloaded um, into, um, into the area. Now, my, I, I don't have a lot of land. I work with landowners, but I, I, I myself only own about half, half an acre. But I can, I can zoom in um, and you can actually find the parcel boundaries just, if, just by zooming in. Um, and I'll, I'll just share that one of the, the nice things that you can do right from the very beginning is if you wanna click on it, um, then once again, that box, box pops up. But if you want it to stay highlighted so you can kind of keep track of where your property is, um, then you can you can click this box at the bottom that says add to results. Um, and it'll give you some other information over there, but you can click out of this, you can kind of click out of this or go to the map layers over here. And you can zoom in and out and it'll stay highlighted, which is sometimes just kind of nice to get you a nice sense of where you are. Now, I'm gonna pause here um, and say that whenever we're working with maps like this, I just wanna recognize that um, it, we can get, it can get overwhelming very quickly. <laughs> um, and there's just a lot of words, there's a lot of information. Um, I might be going really quickly on the screen. Um, and I just wanna do a check-in from the very beginning. Uh, we have one how, question how already. How are we doing so far? Could you give me like a thumbs up or? Okay, yep. Quick what's question. The, what's just, the question? Just on um, how much land is valid? Do you have, does it have to be, um, a, an actual parcel that someone owns, or can you go and look at, you know, just a small little, even smaller area? Yeah, so what's highlighted right now in the red area on this map um, are the tax maps. It's whatever the town, your town, uh, provided to the state as the tax map boundaries. Um, I will say some of these are very inaccurate. Um, I think Middlebury is, is one of the better <laughs> towns in the state, um, the one that I'm, I'm in right now. Uh, some of the work I do up for Cold Hollow to, um, to Canada up in Franklin County, the parcel boundaries are way like off um, because they're basically taken from hand-drawn maps that the town had until very recently, and they've been scanned in. Um, but in terms of finding those ba those boundaries, um, you'll only find those for the for the tax map boundaries. But the nice workshop that we can do. You can do this at any scale. Um, you don't have to use your own boundaries. You can you can focus on any area you're interested in. Um, so oh, I keep accidentally <laughs> um, clicking on things here. But now with with you know the parcel that I that I have in mind um, highlighted, and I'll 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 focus on on other parcels later. Um, but just to kind of show you how the tools work, you'll notice that over here on the left hand side of the screen, um, on the bottom very bottom 
there are three different tabs. Um, when you first open the atlas, it's this one that just says Natural Resources Atlas. It has kind of the overall over, overview information about it. But most of what you're going to do when you get there um, is going to this layers menu. And the layers menu is where you have all kinds of map layers um, that you can turn off and on. These are basically all of the maps. I'll, I'll call them layers, but it's kind of another layer that you can put on top of the map that you see on the, on the screen. These are basically everything that the Agency of Natural Resources, all of the different departments, Fish and Wildlife, uh, Forest, Parks and Rec, the geology with USGS, rivers, stormwater, um, each department kind of maintains their own list of, of layers, map layers that you can turn on and off. Um, now, I'm not going to go into a lot of these right now. Uh, I'll just let you explore these on your own later. Uh, but some of them can be really interesting. Like under geology, you can turn on, you can find the soils. You can see what kind of soil um, is, is on, your, on your property. Um, once again, once you pull up the soils map, for example, you can click on it. Um, you might need to go through these. This is giving me the parcel. And what I want is uh, the soil type. Um, and it tells you, you know, in this case, it'll tell you this little code CW and you might think, I don't know what that means. But if, you, if, you're, if you're a gardener or if you're interested in planting things, you might follow this soil report. That's the link. And learn additional information. Again, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on each of these layers here. My point here just being you can keep following these links um, and dig way into lots of information on your land or the surrounding area and then just kind of jump back to where you want to be. If you're done with the soils layer, you can turn that off. You can you can see some of the things that we did in um, in the Vermont Master Naturalist class, for example, we talked a lot about the glacial lakes that used to be here. So you can you can think about, you know, this is the coverage of Lake Vermont, which was here after the glaciers melted away. And you can think about, you know, like my house that's highlighted um, was underwater, even though nearby Chipman Hill was an island outside of that lake. So you can, you can put together some of these stories. Um, but once again, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go through a lot of these. I just want to give you a sampling of um, of the depth <laughs> that you can really go into as you're exploring this resource. Um, but even without using the maps themselves and turning them off and on, um, some of the most useful information that you can get as a landowner out of this um, is really just from looking at the aerial photographs, the imagery that's preloaded into um, the, the Agency of Natural Resources Atlas. Because if you're thinking about wildlife or wildlife movement, um, which was one of the things that we talked about when, when announcing this course, um, then a lot of that is really just dependent on where are the forests? Where are the waterways? Um, where are the open fields? And how do those things connect? Um, and really no matter where you are in the state, you can zoom in and out and start to put together um, really a picture of, um, sorry, I keep <laughs> accidentally, as I'm scrolling in and out, um, pushing it, pushing the button there. But you can really start to piece together, um, even I'm, I'm in town, I have a very little parcel, but you can start to think about, you know, well, there's this forest behind my house, Chipman Hill, and there's this other forest nearby in Means Woods. How do they connect? Um, can I even just zoom in and think about you know, if I were an animal, how would I move through this area? And this is where it gets really interesting for a landowner to start to think about some of these patterns. Um, now, if you live locally, you may have heard that frequently in a couple neighborhoods, right in Middlebury even, um, we have bear encounters on occasion. Uh, and so, and we also, we definitely see them on Chipman Hill. They definitely are found in Means Woods and they're found in, um, in some of the neighborhoods um, by, by Battelle Woods, for example. And if you just start to think, you don't even need to turn anything on or off, but if you start to just look at the pattern of forests and waterways, um, then you can really start to think about, okay, um, well, how do they get to Chipman Hill? Chipman Hill itself is probably not a bear habitat. Probably over here in the Green Mountains is better bear habitat. Um, you can start to piece together, even from just these aerial images, can you kind of see where the forests connect? Um, so you can go from the Green Mountains over by Bristol and start to follow these, these pathways. Um, 
and they start to open up and you start to realize, oh, that's probably where the wildlife are coming from, the bears that are right here um, next to Chipman Hill, very close to, to the Middlebury um, Town Center. And then once they're there, you can start to zoom in and think about, oh, you know, right over here, that's where, that's where, that's, that's the most logical connection. And as I drive this road all the time, I can actually confirm that I've seen several bobcats that are crossing the road. This is Washington Street Extension, if you know the area. And this is where they cross. This is where I see wildlife all the time. And so, so you can start to kind of think about where these connections are. Um, now, sometimes it's hard to tell you know, what, what am I looking at here on this map? Sometimes it can be hard to tell what's forest um, or what are different types of forests. And this is where really uh, another really simple tool comes in. Um, now, I, I wanted, I'm, I'm actually intentionally stopping on this point on Chipman Hill where there's this big vertical line in the middle of the stream, if you can see that. Um, and this is just where photos were taken at different times of the year and they're all kind of pieced together to make the resource. And so this is an edge. But if you're trying, if, you, if this were your woods or if, if you want to manage this or you, you want to think about um, how to use the map information for your own purposes, it's, it can be really confusing when you're looking at, you know, are those different kinds of trees or is it just a picture taken at different times? And this is where there's a resource that I find really helpful. Um, down here at the very bottom corner, where it says, it right now says Esri World. If you click on this, it allows you to change the background. Um, now, if you like to look at, um, say topo maps, there are topo maps down here, but there's one in particular, the CIR orthos. Um, it's color infrared is what CIR stands for. And the, these color infrared photos um, show you basically where the heat is coming from. And these are, this imagery is taken in, um, in spring. So after the snow has melted off the ground so that the snow doesn't appear in the photos, but before the deciduous trees have leafed out, um, and so I, I love looking at these because it tells you where, um, where the heat is coming from in a forest. Um, it tells you kind of forest productivity. And you can start to pick out not only you know, where the forests are, but where are the conifers. Um, so I can look in on Chipman Hill and realize, oh, this western edge has a lot of conifers on it. Um, right up on the, on the top, it's, it's mostly hardwoods. And then down at the, you know, at the bases again, um, some more conifers come in. And this can be really interesting, again, when you're thinking about, say, wildlife habitat. Um, the, the kind of the famous place where, where conifers come in is, is the deer wintering areas where, where deer will, will congregate um, in the winter. Um, but a lot of other animals use that shelter in winter as well, um, because where there's, where there's the tree cover, the, the conifer cover, it means the snow on the ground is much, um, it's not as deep. And so lots of animals can get around better and find their food sources. Um, and so if you find some of these on your own property, then it, it's just, you know, you might know from walking your own property where they are, but you can really use this as a management tool as well. If you're thinking about how to manage your land um, or think about where different wildlife habitat might be on the land. Um, and so this is just kind of a nice background image to keep in mind. Any thoughts or questions there? I'm just gonna take a breath and, and, and open it up. Um, are there questions that have come up from, from what we're, we've already talked about? If not, I'll share a couple other tools. Yes, Phyllis is asking, how did you know red signified conifers and non-red was deciduous? Yeah, so, so the color infrared is really an indication of where heat is coming off of the ground. Um, in living systems, that, that tends to mean um, it's where there's a lot of productivity, like a lot of, of growth. Um, and those conifer trees it, at this time of year before the deciduous trees have really have leafed out. Um, they're not, you know, the deciduous trees are not doing photosynthesis yet. Um, they're not, they're not, they're not really active um, and they're not, they're not putting out heat the way the conifers are. Um, and so, so it's a way, and, and in fact, if, you know, if you, you want to kind of test this out, you can do this in a place that, that you're familiar with, but going back to, to my own parcel, um, let me see if it, oh, it looks really blurry right there. Okay, there we go. It stopped being blurry. If you can see where this, this really bright pink is, 
it's it's a row it's a row of, of cedars it's arborvitae and you can see how much they just really pop out um, back here all of these those are all pine trees whereas there's actually there are actually trees in the front of the house too but they're maples um, and so if you want to and I know my um, the the yellow block block is, is kind of blocking where those trees would be, but you really can't see them at all. Um, if you want to just kind of test this out in an area where, where you are, this just this one this one image alone can really be a great tool for thinking about um, the productivity of your area. Um, now, if you want to get really into detail, and, and this isn't my area of expertise so much, but, but farmers are actually starting to use um, these color infrared um, maps to show things like their field productivity as well. Um, and this is more in large scale agriculture out west. But, um, but it's, it's a really interesting tool because they can actually see, you know, is there a place that's not getting watered as well or getting too much water and their, their plants, their crops are not growing. Um, so it can be a way of testing out their systems. Or, or in fact, even in the, the fields that I'm showing you right now, um, this field and this field, you can see, you know, this is early spring. The, the grass is just starting to grow in this hay field. Um, well, this is also a grassy field. This one is fertilized and this one is not. <laughs> and so you can actually really tell the difference um, just from the color infrared photo that you know, this one has started to, to grow. Um, and it's probably because of, of the manure that's spread on the field, um, whereas this one hasn't had any inputs. Um, and it actually shows uh, the difference in color infrared. Um, so getting back to the bigger picture, though, unless there were other questions on that, on that, sorry, it's hard to see the chat while I'm also sharing my screen. So, so please let me know if there are questions that are coming up. Um, but there are a couple other tools that you can use, layers that you can put on um, that will that will help show you these these patterns as well. And again, think about how your land, if you're a landowner, and we'll zoom into bigger parcels than my little half acre block here too. Um, but help you think about how your land might fit into the bigger picture. Um, the next, the, the next one I'd like to show you, um, and you'll notice what I just did. I wanted to see the map bigger, so I, I clicked on this little arrow to turn off the layers. But you can always bring it back on again too. Uh, I'll just kind of demonstrate that again. I know sometimes when you're starting to use it, you might do that by accident and wonder where did where did all the map layers go? Um, they're still there. They're just kind of hiding. But one, one tool for, for working with landowners that I find really helpful um, is this one, if you turn on the fish and wildlife blocks, and then anytime you find a plus sign over here, if you press the plus sign, um, it gives you a long list of be a minus, you can collapse it and make it smaller. But going to the plus sign and going way down on that list of, of fish and wildlife, one of the ones that I find really nice to, to, want, to look at is the habitat blocks one. Um, because this is this is a way that you can see um, the forests in a different way. I'm actually going to turn off the color infrared for the moment so that the colors aren't aren't confusing. But what these habitat blocks do, um, I'm going to click on that again so you can see the, the key. But the habitat blocks, you can ignore really the color for the moment, but anything highlighted um, is the, the, it's the state tool for saying where are their forests um, and where is their fragmentation. And so they've basically gone through all of the forests in the state. Um, I'll zoom out a little bit so you can see the diversity of colors here. And they've said, where are their blocks of forest um, that are all connected together and where are they surrounded by, by development and roads? Um, and um, and so each one of these, I can click anywhere on here, and everything that's highlighted right now is one what they call habitat block that is unfragmented. There are no roads going through there, maybe some class four roads, but no class three roads. Um, there's no development within that. Um, and so it's just kind of a neat way of seeing all of that together is wildlife habitat. There still might be hiking trails. There might be some seasonal camps there. There might be some other things going on. It's not, you know, there's definitely some human use in there, um, but that is surrounded by roads and development, and there aren't any roads or development inside. Now, um, now they've 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 created these blocks all over the state. Um, everything that you see here that's highlighted is a is a forest block of at least 20 acres. So anything lower, less than 20 acres, is not highlighted. But these are all at least 20 acres. 
Um, it's also assigned some priority. And again, the state level priorities where they're saying in terms of um, the biodiversity within forest blocks, um, they give these, these, some of these blocks like this one up in, in Bristol, um, Bristol and Moncton, uh, this ridge line up there. This is actually a weight of 10 where they say in terms of biodiversity, the number of species that live there, this is a really highly important block. Um, and these are, these are also divided up um, by the area. So part of the reason that, the, that, that this is ranked so highly is because compared to other Champlain Valley blocks, this is one of the biggest and it's one of the most intact. Um, and it's very closely connected to all of these other ones in the Green Mountains. And so there's a lot of life that just happens in that block. Um, and it tends to be that as you get to these very small blocks, um, then they have a lower number, a lower, lower ranking system. But small blocks are not always um, ranked in a low way. Well, it's true that, that the biggest blocks in the state, um, like these ones on the spine of the Green Mountains, tend to be very highly ranked. Um, there are also some really highly ranked ones like um, over by the mouth of Otter Creek um, in Ferrisburg. There are a few of these, like this is not really a very big forest block, um, but it does have a pretty high weight because of all the biodiversity there, for example. Um, and there are some other, some other examples of that, of some smaller ones that have a, a really high ranking. Now, this can be really helpful um, to just kind of see what, what is forest and where are the forests around us. Um, I'm actually going to, to zoom in to um, a place that's, that's not Chipman Hill behind my house, um, but a slightly bigger parcel. I think some of you may have been, may have gone to some of the workshops at Barbara's place um, that were another part of the series. So I'm going to just kind of zoom into her place if that's okay, Barbara. And look at um, and look at, at, at her, her, her property here. So this is this is Barbara's place. And um, and you can see that within the Champlain Valley, um, there really aren't that many blocks of habitat that are over um, that are over 20 acres. There are these kind of patches of them, and and we can think about them in terms of again, just thinking about well, where are the forests? And where are the waterways? And how do they connect across this area? And so you can see that in the kind of the northwestern corner of, Bar of Barbara's place, there is one of these forest blocks. It's not super highly ranked at the state level, um, but it's certainly a forest block, um, a habitat block. And again, even if you don't want to turn on or off any other layers, you can start to think um, about well, so if you have this property right here, and the biggest block of forest around is right here. Well, where are there other blocks of forest? Where are the waterways and how do they connect? And this is where things can get really interesting as a landowner um, to start to think about, can you make way for wildlife? Um, can, you, can you enhance some opportunities to make this block that is, is there and is significant um, act like an even bigger block? So sure, there's a road here, and it's actually a pretty well-trafficked road. But if wildlife can get from here to here, um, then maybe you can make those two blocks that are kind of small basically act like a much bigger block. Um, and if you were if you were part of um, of Tina Sharp's workshop before, then she talks about some of this too, where I know on on Barbara and Bill's property, then they've really enhanced this this area in here and also down this way thinking about how wildlife are likely to travel across their land. Here's one forest block, here's another forest block, here's a waterway, and that's probably where most things are going to go. Um, this means if you have opportunities, um, if, you, if you're wanting to, to build things, then probably as far away from that network um, is, is probably the best place to do it. And if you're trying to enhance um, shrub cover, for example, or forest cover, or um, or bird pathways, um, then a lot of animals are going to be trying to follow this pathway from, from this block to this block to this block, and they're going to be following the, the forest fragments that are there, um, and they're going to be following the waterways. Now, if you'd like another view 
um, that kind of shows you the same thing, but through another map. There's another map that I'd really highly recommend. I'm going to turn off the habitat blocks. This other map is not going to be found under this, this these operational layers that are already here, um, but I'm going to show you how you can find it. Um, this is a tool that the state has put together, the Agency of Natural Resources has put together, and it's called BioFinder. Um, and BioFinder um, really asks the question of, you know, within the state of Vermont, there's clearly going to be more development, and we're clearly going to be clearing more, and we're going to have more roads. But if we want to maintain the same level of biodiversity and integrity and forest health that we have right now, what are the places that are most important to maintain in order to do that? Does that make sense? I'll repeat it in just a second after I show you where it is. To find this map that has been put together, this tool, you can go up in the top left-hand corner to where it says Atlas Layers. And you can actually see that there are many more layers than what are preloaded into the, the Agency of Natural Resources Atlas. You can really explore this for a long time. So you can go down to this part that's called BioFinder and BioFinder just pops up now on this map. Now, I'll repeat again what this green is trying to show. It's asking the question, if we are to maintain um, the level of biodiversity that we currently have in the state, if we want that to stay here, what are the lands and waters that we that are most important to protect or conserve or maintain as they are um, in order to maintain that biodiversity? Does that make sense? Kind of thumbs up if that kind of makes sense. And what they've come up with is this network um, in the dark green. I'll start out with this. The dark green is, is the highest priority network where the Agency of Natural Resources has, basic, has basically said, if we can maintain just this network, this dark green network of lands and waters, then we're going to be in good shape moving forward, keeping the species that we currently have in the state, even as the climate changes. Um, because of course, as the climate is changing, then plants and animals and everything are going to be trying to kind of expand their ranges or contract their ranges or move where they need to move um, to adapt to new circumstances. And the best way to, to prepare our forests and our species to do that um, is to have these connected networks, these connected pathways going through the state. Does that make sense? Yes, no, maybe? Okay. Um, and so as we, as we look through the state, if at the state level, um, I won't zoom quite out to the state level, but just going into this area where you can kind of see the green mountains, the green mountains, it's largely um, protected land or federal or, or state land already. Not all, definitely not all, um, but it's where the, the bulk of our intact habitat and our conserved land in the state already exists. Um, once you get down into the Champlain Valley, um, then what this con Vermont conservation design, um, which is the, the name of the map that's found on BioFinder, is, is demonstrating these networks other. I will zoom out for just a minute um, and then I'll, I'll come to you too, Barbara. Um, but the idea here is that this isn't just, it's looking at, at Vermont, but it's really making a network um, of connections that goes down south into the Berkshires and up into Canada, west to the Adirondacks, east over to the White Mountains. And so if we can maintain this network, um, then our species really should be able to um, to go wherever they need to go. Um, and every piece of that, even right here in Middlebury or Weybridge or where you're from, um, you know, what happens to maintain this network is going to be, is going to, to be, to de determine what happens at that much larger scale. Barbara, go ahead. Um, Allison had a question for right here, which are, wh what are the light, bright green patches? That's a very good question. Um, thank you for, for asking that. So the green patches, so if, if the, the dark green is, um, the dark green represents the highest priority. Like those are the lands and waters that really need to be maintained if we're going to see the same level of biodiversity in the future. 
Um, the green patches are priority, but they're not quite as high. And the reasons for that um, are a few things. For one reason, if you zoom into Middlebury, um, right in town, for example, you'll see a lot of that light green. This is basically the floodplain of Otter Creek. Um, now, ideally, for ecological reasons, um, it would be great if we could maintain all of that land um, as a river corridor. Now, this is also in downtown Middlebury, right? It's, it's kind of unlikely. There's a lot of other stuff happening. <laughs> um, it's probably unrealistic to think about restoring that as, as natural habitat, or at least all of that. We're putting it on the map because it would be great ecologically if that could happen. But we're also kind of, the state is accepting that's, that's unlikely. And you know what, it's okay. As long as we just look at that dark green, that's probably good. Um, so that's one, one category. The other category that tends to come up um, are these places like in Ripton, where if you look at Ripton, and this is true with a lot of, of, of um, Green Mountain towns, where the whole, the, the whole town is, is, you know, there's so much forest in Ripton, um, and it's all really important, right? <laughs> if you want to maintain ecological habitat um, and resilience, then it would be great if we could, could, could maintain all of that. But in a place like Ripton, uh, we can also identify some of these places where, well, this is a smaller forest block. It's not quite as big. It would be great if we could maintain all of that. But if we need some place to develop in Ripton, um, then it would be better to add more houses in this area <laughs> um, than into the middle of the, of the Green Mountain forests. Does that make sense? Um, so this is kind of a, it's kind of a planning tool. Now, if you live in one of these forests, you might be saying, oh, but we want to maintain forests there too, which is logical. Um, and if you're, you know, trying to develop the area, you might be thinking, well, yeah, why would you keep that? Um, if you can, you know, we need some place where we can build. And there are all kinds of, of perspectives. And it's, you know, this is just kind of a tool helping us think about how to prioritize some of those. Barbara? Yeah, Marion has a couple of questions and that this might be a good time to bring yeah. them in um, about, you know, how do you get land developers to consider these pathways for wildlife? Is this tool typically brought in front of planning commissions and, and zoning yeah. boards in the, in this, in the um, small communities? And then she asked a very specific question about the land around Chipman Hill. Mm -hmm. In the future, when that's developed, how how will this disrupt the wildlife pathways? In other words, is there a way that you can use this tool to predict what will happen if there's development in that spot? Yes and no. So I'm going to start with the first one in terms of, of sharing this. Um, I, what I will say is the Agency of Natural Resources is very actively pursuing getting this in, in into the hands of um, say planning commissions at the town level, definitely pl uh, regional planning commissions at, at, the, at the regional level, um, are, the regional planning commissions across the state are very well aware of this tool um, and all of these maps. Um, and also into state um, uh, state statutes. So Act 171, uh, which, which came out, oh, how long was it? Uh, how long ago was it? I want to say maybe five years ago now. Um, I may have lost track of time, but <laughs> um, somewhere in that ballpark has actually said that, that, that regional plans and town plans um, must identify, um, uh, what, are the, what are their words? I'm forgetting their words here, but the habitat blocks and habitat connectors, forest blocks and habitat connectors, that's, that's their words. Um, that, that are important at that community level. Um, now, this is a tool that, that planning commissions can use. There, it's, it, the state mandates do not say that they have to follow this exactly, but this is a tool that is made available at the local level um, to help planning commissions identify these areas. Now, in terms of that second question um, of what would happen is, can this tool predict uh, what would happen if we don't protect these I'm not sure it can exactly predict that, but it's kind of saying, you know, this is, these are our connected pathways. Um, there will probably be diminished biodiversity if this does not re remain intact. Now, exactly what that looks like is much harder to predict, but there will be lower biodiversity if, 
if we can't maintain these corridors. Does that make sense? It's pretty general, um, but it's kind of the best we can do with a, with a modeling tool like this um, at a state level instead of looking at a site-specific place like Chipman Hill. Um, now, in terms of, um, I'm looking at the time, I want to make sure we, we just kind of cover a couple, couple more quick things. Um, but I want to zoom back into a specific place again um, to, to think about as a, as a landowner. Now, you, don't, you can't control the whole network, right? But you do have management um, decisions over, over one tiny piece of it. So how can you use a tool like this on a single property? Um, and I want to go back into, I want to zoom back into Barbara's place in this one, this parcel um, right here. here I'm going um, to add it to results like I did earlier so it just stays highlighted. And if you own just this one parcel of land, um, how might you think about using this tool? And what I would say is the first thing you can do is think about where did Vermont Conservation Design, where did this tool highlight um, on or near your, your land? And in this case, um, on Barbara's land, this, this stream was the thing that really popped out as being part of the network um, that, that at the very, at the state level, at the, at the at the regional level, at the multi-state level, this is really important. Um, and what happens here, if wildlife can get through here, this is part of that picture of maintaining di biodiversity between the Berkshires and the Adirondacks and Canada and the whites. Um, it's part of that entire network. And so what happens right here could actually impact um, that, that whole wildlife network at a much larger scale. So, you know, if, if you, if for Barbara and Bill, um, just using this one tool, if you were to think about one place to focus their efforts, I might recommend that they make sure to maintain this. And knowing, having been to Barbara's property in one of these workshops, I know they really have been focusing on this area. Um, and, and, and I think Barbara, you've even talked about how much wildlife goes through this area, correct? And, and you, you know the wildlife on your land very well. Yes. So it's incredible. Um, yeah. So so this is the one. It's a modeling. It's it's just a model. Like nobody came out to the to Barbara's land to map this. Um, but it's a model that does tend to predict how how wildlife um, are likely to move. And this is even you know in terms of trees expanding their ranges or or contracting their ranges or moving around um, as the climate changes, they need these kind of pathways to move too. They can only go as far as their seeds, <laughs> their seeds travel. Um, now you might be thinking, but what about this other habitat block that we talked about earlier? Um, one thing that's kind of interesting about about thinking about it, your individual parcel um, in terms of a Vermont conservation design is you may end up, you know, with some of your land in the design. If you own one of these other parcels up here, you might be thinking, but what's in it for me? What can I do? Um, you can still use the concepts involved in, in Vermont conservation design, um, it, which is really thinking about where are the forests and where are the waterways um, and where are, where are the places where things can avoid development. You can use those same concepts to think about, well, where are the best wildlife pathways around you, even if you're not in, in, in one of the dark green areas. For example, um, this patch of forest that we highlighted earlier didn't come out as a state priority. Um, but if you live here, you certainly will still know that there are there are wildlife living there. Um, and they will continue living there as long as there are these connections, as long as they can get from one place to another. And so if this group of landowners all really think about, um, well, can, are there ways that we can maintain this woods? Um, then you're really going to have connections that extend not just where the dark green are, but from that dark green into this forest and over into this area and beyond. And those can all become wildlife pathways. Does that make sense? If on the other hand, you're in a place that um, is really not on, the, on, on Vermont conservation design at all, <laughs> um, but you have some habitat, which that happens too, um, then it, all, all hope is still not lost. Um, because, but then you might think about things like, instead of, of mammals, say, um, bobcats or bear that have to walk from one place to another, 
then you might be thinking about, well, are there ways I can attract birds and pollinators um, and, and things that fly that don't need continuous pathways, but can kind of fly over some of the development and still find where you are. Um, if does that make sense too? So even in an in an urban garden, you can attract all kinds of kinds of pollinators, um, even if not connected to this this land and water based network. I'm afraid I've probably overwhelmed you. <laughs> um, there's a lot more I, more detail I could go into, um, like the detail of of what went into BioFinder and how you can break it apart and tell the different components of it. Um, but I think for the moment, I'm actually going to stop sharing. Go back to, to where I can see all your faces. Um, see if there are other questions and see if there are things in these last few minutes that, that you would like to see in more detail um, or, or make maps or, um, you know, we could, I could show you how to print off a map of your land or something like that. But what are, what are your interests? I'm curious. I know Mary just um, asked the question in the chat. Um, and I don't know, Mary, if you want to just ask it now instead of having it in the chat. But um, about yeah, why don't you why don't you unmute yourself and ask it? Yes, that that probably is easier. So I'm looking at the map, Monica, that you just referred to, and note, and you made the comments that the properties to the west and north of Barbara and Bill's property are are really important and it makes sense, but they're not showing up. And I'm wondering, uh, those, those are two different statements. One, they're not showing up, but two, they're really important. And I'm, yeah. I'm, uh, one of the things I'm a little concerned about is as I work in my community, I, I find Binder, BioFinder helpful, but I also find that it's not picking up the uh, in, uh, close, readings of the properties that need that are really critical so yeah. um I, you know it, it it it's it's a it's a plus and it's a minus um but i also don't understand why it can't be a plus <laughs> entirely yeah, so that's that's a really good question and i think the difference here is scale um so i'm actually going to go back to to show you the map again while i talk so I think when I when we were zoomed into Barbara's place highlighted here, I said people who live there might think this is really important. Or I don't know the way I said it before, um, but you know I know that Barbara sees lots of wildlife, and they probably do come from this area as well. Um, and here's the thing about these maps is that they're made at this scale. <laughs> Um, they're made for the entire state. And in fact, they're made looking beyond the entire state. They really are looking at um, these connections. Actually, I'm going to show you something right now what they're what they're kind of based on. Um, here are some of the, the, the layers that go into it. Um, I'm going to show you just a few things here. Um, looks like it's working hard to, to get this up. You know what? I'm going to turn that one off right now if it load a little faster. But here's, here's the point as, it, as this map layer is, is loading. What I will say is at the state level, there have had to be a lot of, of decisions made because the Agency of Natural Resources was, uh, was under a lot of pressure to make this map and, 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 and make some, some value judgments on what's most important and what's not. And they're doing that at this scale. Um, and they were given a lot of pressure where they basically said, we need housing in the state and we need roads in the state and people are coming here and we need a place to put them. And that's all true, right? We're all, you know, we, we've all heard these arguments. Um, and and so, so the agency had to make these, these value judgments and they're, they're looking at the scale when they're doing this. Um, what I'm showing you right now is really what they're looking at. Um, what a lot of those maps were, were based on is these purple layers. Um, the purple is uh, the, it includes the biggest forest blocks in the state. And it's including those most, those, those really highly biodiverse um, blocks in the state. Um, and if you look at just the purple, I'm gonna 
gonna turn off the yellow for just a second. If you look at just those purple, purple blocks, um, there are some really big forest blocks in the state. Um, and then there are these, these places that kind of follow the rivers where there are a lot of wetlands and um, really biodiverse areas. But ANR was say, it, it looked at those and thought, well, but if they're completely surrounded by development, those, those are not going to stay, um, they're not gonna continue to have their same biodiversity. They're not gonna keep their integrity. We need connectivity blocks. These are blocks of forest that, that link them up. Um, and, and so they're basically, what these are based on is taking, is making these networks that go all the way up to Canada from the Berkshires and all the way over from the Adirondacks. Now, Addison County, if we zoom back in, and I know Mary, you've seen you've seen these maps. I know we've worked together before, and you've, you've thought a lot about these and, and seen these a lot. But Addison County is this kind of funny place where, because of our human land use history um, and the intensive agriculture that was here in the past, and is, is still we're still the you know the heart of agriculture for the state. Um, there's a lot less. Um, our, our forest blocks tend to be much smaller. Um, and they tend to be much more fragmented. Now, if we zoom into a place like Cornwall, as I know Mary has seen these, these many times before, these are this is kind of the, the biggest blocks of forest that we have left um, are in these, these, these forest blocks. And at the state level, that's kind of what they say, that's, that's, that's what we can do. That's what we can manage at the state level. Um, we can we can try to link these together as best we can, and then the the, third, the another layer in there is the is the surface waters and the riparian areas, and that's that's kind of what we can do right now if we're just looking at the very highest priority at the state level. But this is where you, as a landowner, don't have to look at this from the state level. Um, the planning commission have to, has to look at it from a town level. The regional planning commission has to look at it from a regional level. Um, Agency of Natural Resources has to look at it from um, the state level, but you as a landowner um, can look at it from a very different angle. You can zoom into your place, um, like Barbara is over here, and you can think about what's important to you. And you can think about the wildlife that you know are there um, and, and think about, about what you have control over to maintain. Um, and I guess I, I know that's probably still really unsatisfying, um, but I think that's that's why some of these other blocks like this one by Barbara isn't highlighted because at the state level, um, they just, it's, it doesn't, it, it's not as big and it's not as biodiverse as some of the other ones. Go ahead, Barbara. Well, just just to add to that, I know that personally, we we were surprised at the house, the mapping turned out on our property, um, based on what we know from mm -hmm. the many years of living on it, being an inhabitant. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things that we did is we engaged Tina Scharf, a, a, a wildlife biologist and Audubon, Vermont, to come and do their own kind of look at this. Um, area, look at the maps, and then zero in on our land to see, you know, what what did they think? What did they know? What did they their expertise in these particular kinds of habitats? And how could we? What was the best thing we could do to help and maintain these these connected pieces, and also just to just to be good habitat. And so they both said, well, you, you know, the state maps only go so far, right. as, as Monica has been saying, and as Mary's been asking, but there are, other, there are other resources that we have that we can call upon to help us with those questions on a very personal, small landowner basis. And we're really lucky in Vermont because we do have those options. And we have to finish, Monica, because yeah. Um, we're, we're right at eight. Do you have any last thing you want to say about this? Can I just kind of finish up that one where yeah. I know uh, Barbara and Mary conserve land and in this network that we're looking at, there's, there's other conserved land as well. And even though it doesn't appear on Vermont conservation design, when you look at the ways to protect the, the habitat that is here, even if it wasn't a state level priority, well, it's now. 
um, it's now conserved and it's going to, it's go, it, that is now habitat that's going to remain there. Um, and if we can connect those investments of conserved land into a bigger picture too, then that actually becomes part of the design, whether it's on the map or not, um, which I think is kind of cool. You're, you're, adding to, you're adding to this network um, where it didn't exist before and you're just improving upon it. So <laughs> I can just end with that. Um, I guess I'll also end by just saying um, this, the, the Natural Resources Atlas, there is so much you can do. Um, we've really just brushed the surface and dig into any of the tools or the, you know, the things that you can do to interact with it or print off maps or anything like that. But I do want to invite any of you on this workshop tonight um, to just reach out. I can, I can put my email in the, in the chat if that's helpful. Um, and, and please feel free, if you get a chance to just play around on the maps and you end up with questions, please feel free to reach out and, um, and send me an email, ask a question, give me a call. I'm, I'm really happy to, to talk maps anytime <laughs> and I'm happy to help. So thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, Monica, and thank you all for coming tonight. And one last piece from the, the Vermont Master Naturalist Program for our capstone experience is we have put together um, a big array of resources, uh, of, of, of a web page that will be linked off the Vermont uh, Master Naturalist site, off of Audubon, off Malt, um, various places in the state. Um, for all kinds of resources for you um, to, to um, look into. And we also hope that you'll add to that list of resources as you come across them. And we will be sending them to you, this uh, the link to you um, following this workshop in a few days um, and welcome your comments and your, and your additions to it. But thank you so much for coming. I mean, it's such a treat, it's such a special thing to have Monica with us because she is one of the great experts in these mapping tools and, and so much more. So also sign up for the Vermont Master Naturalist Program. And with that, we'll say good night. Good night, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. And thank you, Barbara, for putting this together.